Okay, welcome uh, to the Veterans Committee. I am not Chaim Deutsch. Um, I am Council Member Justin Brandon. But I'm going to, uh, before I get into um, opening remarks, I want to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Councilman Danny Drum. Wait, I have to gavel in, right? Now it's official. Okay, thank you very much, Council Member Brannon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak first. I do have to leave early because I'm going to the wake and then the funeral tomorrow for uh, State Senator Jose Feralta, uh, who was a very close friend of mine. So um, anyway, um, our service members have given much to this country, often at great personal sacrifice. Among these are many lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals. Sadly, for decades, LGBTQ service members who laid their lives on the line for this nation were unfairly discharged and barred from future service simply for being who they are. While members of the LGBTQ community can now serve openly, although Trump is now trying to take away that right from transgender Americans, the lives of countless veterans have already been upended by receiving less than honorable discharges. Due to institutionalized homophobia and transphobia, these brave individuals lost access to benefits that could have helped them advance their education and achieve financial stability. My bill, Intro 479, will help restore honor to these American heroes by extending city veteran benefits to those who were unjustly discharged because they are LGBTQ. It will also have the city's Department of Veterans Services offer discharge upgrade assistance, thereby helping these veterans secure the federal benefits that they are due. It is important to stand up and be present for the many service members who fought to keep this country safe but were not treated with the dignity and fairness they deserve. While we can never undo the pain of past discrimination, this legislation brings us closer to achieving, these justice, to achieving justice for these individuals. I thank the members of the Veterans Committee for their support of this important effort. I especially want to thank Chair Deutsch for recognizing the importance of this issue and scheduling a hearing, and for his bill, Intro 1218, which will also be a great help to LGBTQ veterans. And most of all, I applaud the members of the United States Armed Forces, both current and former, for all that you do for this nation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Drum. Please extend my condolences to uh, Jose's family. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Justin Brandon. I'll be chairing this meeting of the Veterans Committee today in the absence of uh, Council Member Chaim Deutsch, who unfortunately could not be here today. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being here and ex extend my warmest regards to the veterans who have joined us this afternoon, first and foremost. Um, today we'll be hearing two pieces of legislation um, that the Councilman Drummond mentioned, both of which are designed to help veterans who have been unfairly impacted by their discharge categorization status. As our veterans can tell, uh, tell you better than I can, certainly, many local, state, and federal benefits available to former service members hinge on the discharge status they received at the end of their military service. There are five types of discharges that a service member can receive. Honorable, general, other than honorable, bad conduct, and dishonorable. Of these five, three discharge types are administrative in nature and allow veterans to qualify for benefits. Uh, those are honorable, general, and other than honorable. Honorable discharge is the highest status a service member can receive. Those discharged under this status are eligible for the full array of benefits offered on this local, state, and federal levels. General and other than honorable statuses of discharge, however, impact service members by denying them certain benefits, such as from the GI bills or even access to, to uh, VA health care. Often these two discharge statuses are referred to as bad paper discharges. The problem is that many veterans have unfairly received bad paper discharges due to circumstances beyond their control that impacted their service. For example, under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the U.S. military discharged over 13,000 LGBTQ members of the armed forces. Many of these discharged individuals received general or other than honorable designations solely because of their sexuality. Veterans have also faced bad paper discharges because of actions stemming from trauma, such as PTSD, mental illness, brain injury, sexual harassment, and sexual assault. There is no understanding or forgiveness here. These veterans lose access to critical benefits simply because of their discharge status. The federal government offers a remedy for impacted service members. Veterans can appeal their discharge statuses to their relevant military discharge review board. 
On the state level, the New York State Department of Veterans Affairs offers free discharge upgrade advisory services to help veterans adjust their status. This program is the first of its kind offered to veterans uh, in the nation. The two bills we'll be hearing today seek to supplement that work on the local level by helping veterans adjust their status and connecting them to resources and groups that will help them adjust their status accordingly. Intro 479, sponsored by my colleague, Council Member Drum, would require the Departments of Veteran Services to offer assistance to veterans discharged other than honorably from the military, the military solely on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity and upgrading their discharge papers or changing the narrative reason for their discharge. The bill would also extend all city benefits and services to LGBTQ veterans who've had bad discharge papers solely because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, and it would require the Department of Veteran Services to issue discharge LGBTQ veterans a cer certificate of eligibility that can be used as proof that a discharge LGBTQ vet is eligible for certain city benefits or services available to benefits. Sorry, available to veterans. Intro to Intro 1218, sponsored by uh, the chair of this committee, Council Member Heim Deutsch, is a complement to Intro 479, which would require Department of Veteran Services to create a unit to assist veterans with discharge, characteriz uh, discharge characterization upgrades and offer non-binding advisory opinions on appeals upon request. The department would also engage in outreach and education efforts to inform veterans about the discharge characterization upgrade process and the newly established unit. So I am now, okay, here we go. So although we can never fully repay veterans for the service they have rendered, we can and must do all we can to support them as they transition back into civilian life. It is our duty as a city to help our veterans where and when they need it the most, especially when they are disadvantaged because of unfair or discriminatory policies or because of trauma they've faced. It's my hope that today's legislation will do exactly that. I want to thank the committee staff, uh, Council Nuzat Ch Chowdhury, Policy Analyst Michael Kurtz, Finance Analyst Zachary Harris, my Legislative Director Jonathan Yedden for their work in making this hearing possible. Um, and I now want to hand it over to my council to swear in uh, the folks from the administration. Uh, if you could both raise your right hands. <clears throat> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond to uh, honestly to council member questions? And if you could both state your name and title for the record, please, and then we can hear your testimony. Sutton and I serve as Commissioner for the Department of Veteran Services. Eric Henry, General Counsel and Director of Intergovernmental Affairs for the New York City Department of Veteran Services. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Council Member Brennan, Council Member Drum, Council Member Mizell, Committee Council, Members of the audience here, which include veteran, veteran advocates, allies, and organizations who are gathered to uh, uh, participate in today's hearing. My name is Lori Sutton, and I'm honored to serve as the founding commissioner of the New York City Department of Veteran Services. I am joined today by Eric Henry, general counselor and director of external affairs. As you know, DVS was created to facilitate access to and coordination with organizations and entities throughout New York City, which serve our veterans community. From outreach and employment assistance to facilitating peer mentoring and whole health services to veteran homelessness reduction, DVS staff members work with veterans one-on-one -on -one to help them figure out what benefits they might be eligible for and how to get access to services. Over this past year, the city ramped up its efforts to serve New York City's most underserved veteran populations to deliver real results for our over half million veterans and their families in the following ways. When the federal government fell behind on delivering the GI Bill benefits that our over 12,000 student veterans rely on as their sole means to pay rent, DVS and the Department of Social Services stepped in to provide emergency rent arrears assistance. This year, through public-private partnerships, we were able to dedicate the first monument to the over 13,000 women service members and veterans in the New York City area, Women Serve. 
at Calverton National Cemetery to honor the service and sacrifice of women in the military. DVS and NYCHA proudly volunteered to be the first city in the country to test out a pilot program to help over 100 formerly disconnected veterans and families who were not eligible for federal subsidy move from transitional housing into safe, permanent homes. Recognizing that nobody serves alone and that families serve too, DVS teamed up with two national organizations, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation's Hidden Heroes Initiative and the Reimagine Project to organize programs dedicated to shining a light on the tireless efforts of our veteran caregivers who provide much needed support to some of our most vulnerable veterans. On Veterans Day, the mayor proudly announced that DVS has launched Vet Connect NYC, a coordinated care network. This is a partnership with Northwell Health, Syracuse University's Institute for Veterans and Military Families, the veteran-owned business Unite Us, and over 80 community service providers. VetConnect NYC's goal is to ensure every veteran gets access to the services they need to lead fulfilling and purpose-driven lives. These are just a few of the ways DVS has leveraged the work of governmental, nonprofit, and private stakeholders to deliver coordinated response and services to our city's underserved veteran populations, and we look forward to future opportunities to do so. Today, I welcome the opportunity to share our views about Councilmember Drum's proposed intro 479, as well as Chair Deitch's proposed intro number 1218. Given the history of discrimination against generations of LGBTQ service members in this country, DVS applauds the City Council for exploring ways to re remedy continued injustices against this population. DVS also appreciates the Council's intention to assist veterans who may have been unfairly given an improper discharge status for other reasons, including mental health conditions. However, while the spirit of the two bills is indeed laudable, DVS recommends collaborating with the Council to identify alternative means to achieve the goal of providing discharge upgrades other than those proposed in Intro 479 and Intro 1218. First, let me share some background about discharge upgrades. Apart from retirement, service members generally separate from the United States military by means of a discharge. There are two types of discharges, administrative and punitive. The most common types of administrative discharge are honorable, under honorable conditions in general, other than honorable and entry level separation for those in service less than 180 days. The most common types of punitive discharge are bad conduct for enlisted service members, dismissal equivalent to bad conduct but only for officers and dishonorable. Administrative discharges are issued by a high ranking officer through a non-judicial process and are generally less severe than punitive discharges. Punitive discharges are generally given for more serious violations and can result from a conviction after a court-martial, which is a military court where prosecutions are tried under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. In order to change a veteran's discharge status, for example, from a bad conduct discharge to an other than honorable, an applicant must apply to their appropriate branch of the Armed Services Discharge Review Board for a discharge upgrade. The applying veteran must convince the board that the discharge in contention was inequitable or improper, which is most effectively facilitated by a veteran service organization or attorney well versed in the procedural complications associated with discharge upgrades. With respect to the proposed legislation before us, I will first discuss intro 479, which would extend city veteran benefits to service members who were discharged because of their LGBTQ status by requiring DVS to issue certificates of eligibility. These certificates would be used as proof that a discharged L LGBTQ veteran is eligible for certain city benefits or services. One of the tenets of good government is fair allocation and application of resources with an eye towards establishing equity for all residents. Discrimination of any kind, especially when based on sexual orientation or gender identification, is a societal stain which should not be facilitated through consideration for city benefits or services. Reflective of this belief, discharge status and LGBTQ status are not identifiers used to screen out applicants for city resources. 
Neither DBS nor other city agencies that have interactions with veterans with whom we've discussed this issue are aware of instances where discharged LGBTQ veterans have been denied city benefits because of their LGBTQ status or their discharge status. For that reason, we believe it is difficult to justify creating such special certificates that would declare or prove their eligibility. That said, we welcome any information that the committee may have that indicates there is a problem and we will explore further any such incidents. With regard to any selective eligibility criteria encountered by veterans, we are aware that the federal and state governments determine eligibility for housing subsidies and civil service credits, respectively, by considering factors such as discharge status and period of service. However, no veteran who applies for city benefits is ever foreclosed from consideration due to discharge, sexual orientation, length of service, or any other identifier. Intro 1218 would require, in addition to the creation of a discharge upgrade assistance unit within DBS, that the department issue non-binding opinions to veterans on their discharge upgrade appeal that they may then submit as evidence with their claim. Where the unit does not deem a claim meritorious, DBS would inform the veteran in writing the reason for its opinion. While the department prides itself on its ability to evaluate veteran concerns and needs and assist coordination of services for delivery, DBS is not a subject matter expert on evaluating the legitimacy of discharge upgrade claims. This bill would require that DBS provide what is actually legal advice and counsel, which is beyond its capacity and is inappropriate because city agencies do not provide direct legal counsel to members of the public. Instead, the city contracts with a range of nonprofit legal services provider organizations that provide free, high quality legal assistance to New Yorkers through the Office of Civil Justice, located at the Human Resources Administration. Since the council and Mayor de Blasio amended the city charter in 2015 to establish the Office of Civil Justice at HRA, OCJ has been tasked with procuring managing and monitoring the city's civil legal service programs for New Yorkers in need, including veterans, facing legal challenges in the areas of housing, immigration, employment law, benefits advocacy, and other areas of civil legal need. HRA's OCJ works in partnership with a number of agencies and mayoral offices, including DBS. As part of this work, OCJ administers the Legal Services for Veterans Program, which in fiscal year 2019 provided funding through discretionary grants by the Council for four experienced nonprofit legal services providers, the New York Legal Assistance Group, the Legal Information for Families Today, Legal Services NYC, and the Urban Justice Center. In total, this year's $450,000 supports legal services for veterans in New York City on a broad range of matters, including family law, housing, public benefits, health care and home care, financial planning, and consumer protection. DVS will continue to refer veterans who seek discharge upgrades to the experts at organizations such as these that conduct this important work for they possess the experience and expertise necessary to see these applications from intake to ultimate disposition. We believe that this is the best means of connecting veterans with the legal assistance they need and indeed have earned for this sensitive, fact-specific application process. The council approved almost two weeks ago intro 394, which specifically provides that discharge upgrade resource information should be part of services offered at veteran resource centers in the five boroughs. The council recognized in that bill and in intro 396, which it approved that same day, that referrals to organizations having subject matter expertise is the most effective way to help our veterans. Ultimately, the administration and city council must determine what are the best policies and practices to support the organizations that provide these invaluable legal resources to our veteran population. We welcome further discussion with the city council, veterans legal service providers, many of whom are testifying today, and advocates to establish the best mechanisms to help veterans connect with legal service providers to receive the valued assistance they need.
Thank you again for this opportunity to meet with you today. At this time, I am happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Councilman Drum to, to start with some questions. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Wren. Um, thank you, Commissioner, also for your testimony. Good to see you again, and nice talking to you just before uh, the hearing started. And in our discussion, we mentioned a little bit about what has been done or what could be done, and I'm grateful for your recognition to uh, collaborate with us here in the City Council to look at ways that we can do outreach. But has any outreach been done since the department itself was created specific to the LGBT community? So the outreach that has been done to this point, Council Member Drum, has been, for example, our active participation during Pride Month uh, activities. We have, for example, this week, I know that uh, we're getting ready to meet with SAGE. Uh, we've met with them in the past as well. Uh, and we greatly appreciate the work that you folks have done uh, and, and continue to do. And we know that when it comes to this particular area of discharge upgrades, we have testified in the past and will continue to actively uh, seek out veterans who may be suffering in silence because they served in the shadows. And, and for example, as just a few years ago, the New York Times in 2015, you may recall that article that so poignantly talked about LGBTQ veterans who were in their 70s and 80s who were finally at a point where you know, they mustered up the courage to apply for the discharge, service discharge upgrades. So we know that there's more work to do. We certainly, certainly um, applaud the council's support for these bills and I know when talking with you that there's no daylight between you and me and the council and the department on this set of issues and I truly look forward to collaborating because I know that we have uh, most likely more than our share of LGBTQ veterans who have come to New York City, much like myself and my sweet Lori and others who've come to New York City to find a home, to find a community, to find acceptance and to be safe in serving here in the city we love so much. So I look forward to working with you and your team to enhance our outreach efforts as we go forward. Thank Good. you. And, uh, you know, I um, represent the Jackson Heights and Elmhurst in Queens, so a yes. big Queens person. And um, I'm Largest wondering... number of veterans in the city. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so have you done any outreach in those boroughs to the, to the senior centers there or to any of the existing organizations in what we call the outer boroughs? You know, what I'll need to do, Chairman or Council Member Drum, is I'd like to get a full accounting of the work that we have done going to both the outer boroughs as well as Manhattan, and I'll be glad to put that information together for you. Okay, good. And, um, you know, I think that um, one of the reasons why we put this legislation forward is um, because while we recognize uh, Mayor de Blasio's commitment to LGBT rights in this administration, your personal involvement in it as well, um, we don't know what the next mayor is going to bring. And so uh, we've seen an administration in Washington, D.C. that is already attempting to take away our rights, and God forbid something like that should happen here in New York City. Uh, and all of the work that either you have done or the work that the council has done in terms of supporting our LGBT veterans could be lost if, in fact, we don't codify it. And so that really is the, the intent of this law. It's not so much to say that uh, we don't feel that you have um, been you know, negligent in terms of um, support for the LGBT community, although of course I, I have many ideas about where we could see further um, visibility, for example, um, but we would like to codify this so that we can ensure that future generations will benefit from this law as well. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined uh, by Councilman uh, yeah, okay. Alan Maisel and uh, my colleague, Councilman Matthew Eugene. Um, Commissioner, just to, to zoom out a little bit, what, what city benefits are available for veterans and which, or are there any city benefits in which we take discharge status into account? At the city level, no. There are, there are no such city level benefits. Okay. Um, so I mentioned in my testimony that at the state and the federal right. level, there's certainly 
uh, are such uh, distinctions that are made. But, but the city we, there's We not. open the aperture at the city level. We really feel like we're the backstop. If, 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 if for anyone who has ever raised their hand and taken that oath, no matter what their discharge status is, when they come in our doors or we find them out in the city, they're our veterans. They're That's our great. family. They're our community. And this is why in my testimony, uh, I found it really um, uh, shocking to, to hear uh, in reading through the introduction uh, from Council Member Drum that there might be such city services, but we are not aware of them. We have looked around and talked to our colleagues across city government. If there are any such city services that someone's aware of that I'm not aware of, please, let's, let's shut that down right away but we are not aware of any city services uh, that are, are limited to veterans based upon either their LGBTQ status or their discharge uh, upgrade status. Okay. I know you, you're, you're usually, you and your team are usually great about sticking around to hear advocates to, to absolutely. speak. So absolutely. There's make sure no more important place for us to be yeah, than right, right here to hear uh, yeah, from our right, advocates. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what city benefits, if any, are veterans restricted from if they have anything less than an honorable discharge status? So, for example, uh, at the federal level, the HUD-VASH uh, program mm -hmm. uh, would be one such program, although I mentioned that we've uh, uh, volunteered uh, this last year, 12 to 18 months, for a federal pilot program where uh, we've been partnering with HUD at the federal level and have actually been able to open the door for veterans uh, who otherwise wouldn't have qualified, over 100 veterans thus far, who wouldn't have qualified for the HUD-VASH uh, voucher program. So, so certainly this is an area that um, we'll continue to look for ways to work with our state and federal colleagues in terms of the uh, distinct distinctions and limitations that are placed on their benefits. We don't have any direct authority, of course, to change that. At the state level, the example, uh, uh, one such example would be the civil service uh, employment uh, veteran uh, benefit. Okay. Um, uh, currently, what services does DBS offer uh, in terms of, of assistance with discharge upgrades? Yeah, so what we do is that we work with, you know, a number of- I guess take me like on a soup to nuts, you know, yeah. veteran walks into your office and what, what happens? So, for example, one such veteran was recently referred uh, to us by one of the providers at the VA, worked with this veteran. Uh, there were a number of complicating issues. We had to do some research first, working with this, this veteran to see really what the full scope of the situation was. Eric and his, uh, uh, his um, uh, our, our employment counsel uh, dug into this and really then started scouting around. We talked to legal counsel in D.C. We talked to legal counsel on the West Coast. We talked to a number of the legal service providers right here in our own area. This particular veteran uh, lives in Long Island, and we were able to link this veteran up with legal services at Hofstra, at their legal clinic. So there, it, you know, it just really depends on what the situation is, what the uh, complicating issues might be. Every situation is a little bit different as you might imagine, uh, but we are very blessed to have in our city just some of the most experienced expert legal services providers that our country, uh, that are available anywhere. And so we're, 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 in, we're in a position where what we strive to do is to engage with any veteran who has, for example, in this case, a legal discharge uh, issue, we establish the relationship. We know that this is an area that's fraught with um, traumatic experiences, uh, perhaps um, uh, really episodes of one's life that, would, that are very difficult to access or to even describe to someone else. And so we build that bond of trust, and that's the bond of trust that allows us then to one, communicate to that veteran that their city cares about them, that their city has their back. We care so much about them that we're going to make sure we will move heaven and earth, we will leave no stone unturned to get them with the right, the best, the most qualified expert legal provider to meet their particular needs. 
and depending on whether it's a family service law issue, a service discharge upgrade issue, a uh, TBI or PTSD issue, a sexual harassment issue. I mean, there are any number of complicating issues, and sometimes, as in the case of this particular veteran, it was so complex that it was just about every one of those issues that was involved, which is why we consulted so widely. Now, you, I would also say that uh, we're very excited with the recent announcement uh, on Veterans Day. Mayor de Blasio, as I mentioned, uh, announced the launch of our Coordinated Service Network, the Vet Connect NYC. This is a rebranding of the pilot program that started here in New York City, but that has over 80 vetted service providers, which includes legal service providers. So we already have um, legal service providers that we have, you know, direct professional collegial relationships with. With the the launch of Vet Connect NYC, that's in, you know, increasing even our reach and. Of as I mentioned, with the change to the city charter uh, by the speaker and the mayor in 2015 and, the, and the, the, the establishment of the Office for Civil Justice, this, this really provides us as a city, it's a, it's a pioneering position for any city to take to invest this kind of treasure, resources, time, expertise, caring for those who are most vulnerable in our midst, including our veterans. Um, do you have an idea of, or an exact number of how many veterans call or, or visit looking for information on um, upgrading their discharge status? You know, I, I know, let me say this, uh, that's not something that we track specifically, but we track in terms of folks who are calling uh, to look into legal service issues or general questions. Let me dig into that data and if I can uh, maybe Discuss this right here. Okay, so for FY18, 105 veterans have contacted us specifically asking that question. Do you feel like that's a low number? You know, like do you feel that this is a tool that we is feel, not? We we feel like our you know as we've stood up this new agency over the last couple of years. We feel like now we're at a point where we can increasingly devote time and attention and resources to enhancing our outreach, our engagement. We've started a newsletter this last year. We're active on social media, but we know that there's more to it of as course. well. So we look forward to really amping up uh, and continuing to uh, uh, enhance the means by which we reach out to our veteran community and to, to, to include families in that as well. Families serve as well. Now, of that 105, do you uh, can you say how many were LGBTQ veterans? I do not have that information. Okay. Not because you don't you don't break it down like that, or because you just don't. Know? What I'll need to do, Council Member, yeah. uh, is I'll need to go back to our records and see if we you know can extract that. When when we talk, when we engage with veterans, it's. It's a voluntary uh, identification if sure. they choose to, to share that with us. And so they don't always, and certainly they don't always up front. But I'll see what level of granularity we have in that okay. data and get back to you on that. Sure. Okay. Um, and I would just, just, uh, uh, just emphasize the point again that particularly – uh, with veterans who have experienced military sexual trauma or in the case of whether it be uh, veterans who served during the Don't Ask, Don't Tell era or even before, uh, trust is a huge issue. And so we don't press that point up front, but sure. we certainly uh, work to establish the relationship and to build the bonds of trust. Okay. Um, and, and which of these two pieces of legislation do you anticipate um, the most, you know, acute challenges in terms of logistics or implementation, the most acute logistical challenges in terms of implementation? Well, so, for example, the um, intro 1218, the creation of a discharge upgrade mm -hmm. assistance unit. Right. Um, Our view is we, we, we applaud the aim, the intent, the uh, 
um, concern that this uh, introduction reflects, uh, but the creation of a discharge upgrade assistance unit, in, in other words, bringing that legal service expertise in-house, we're not allowed as city employees to give direct legal advice and counsel. And we already have a mechanism that's set up where we can connect to, we can refer with the most expert, qualified, experienced legal service providers anywhere. Mm -hmm. And they happen to be here in our city. And the state uh, has also recently in this last year, in fact, we were just talking to Kent Dyler, who was uh, recently appointed to this um, seven member, I think seven legal providers, ser service providers, who from the state level are now also set up to review claims. So there are a number of me mechanisms, both to review claims and to issue a decision whether or not they're meritorious to move forward. And that's the, the really the, the purview of uh, experienced legal service providers who have been, have been authorized to do that kind of work. And then with what we already have at DVS, We've got the, the um, capacity to do what we need to do to establish the relationship with the veteran and or the family member. Sometimes it's an ally, it's a buddy. But we establish that relationship, we get all of the information, and then we work with the legal service providers to make sure that we make the most appropriate and targeted referral, and we stay connected. And that's really our role. That's where we shine as a as a brand new city agency is that we can reach across city government and across our city itself, the public sector, the private sector, the not-for-profit, the philanthropic sectors, and it's a role that we, we cherish. Uh, we're continuing to build our capacity in this area, and it's one which uh, I think is a, an essential link that has never existed to this degree uh, in this city, and as I talk to my city government counterparts around the country, uh, they are, uh, as I've said before in this setting, they've told me in no uncertain terms, Sutton, we've got our eyes on you. You better get it right, New York, because we have what you used to have, which little mayor's office, never more than a couple of folks, if that, sometimes a little more, a little less, but uh, my city government counterparts are, are looking at what we're building here and saying this is what we need. This is the essential municipal investment that both communicates to veterans and their family members how their city cares about them, has their back, and not just the administration, but the city council, the all of city government approach. And then not only communicates that, but has the built up capacity, the enduring infrastructure, the relationships at the federal, at the state, at the local level. It's, it's a privilege beyond uh, anything I can possibly describe to you to work with veterans and their families uh, who have for so long felt like they've been forgotten, felt like they've been dismissed as somehow broken or defective and nothing could be further from the truth. So when they hear you know, the concerns coming out of this committee or this council or this administration or our agency talking about veterans as extraordinary civic assets. As we like to say, veterans and their families are our city's leading natural renewable resource. And what's to be renewed? It's that commitment to and capacity for ongoing service because that's in our DNA. That's in our DNA. Good enough to say thank you for your service. That's better than what our brothers and sisters coming out of the Vietnam War experienced. But the next thing we want to say here in New York City is welcome home. We need you here and now. And if to serve to your fullest capacity now in your civilian post-military uniformed life, you need a service discharge upgrade because something happened way back when or even in the near past. We've got the legal services here to be able to link you up and to make the most of out, out of whatever your situation is. Because even the Department of Defense has acknowledged that particularly, not just in the post 9-11 era, I mean, when you look, for example, uh, with our LGBTQ brothers and sisters, over 100,000 have been discharged since World War II. 
You talk about an impact on our national security. What a, an enormous squandering of human capital and an enormous wound to our collective soul. And so for us as a city to have made this investment and stood up this Department of Veteran Services, I think we can all be proud in this room and we want to share what we're doing. We always want to, you know, we, like I like to say, for however much we've done and however, uh, however much we've achieved, there's always more that we can do when it comes to this area of ensuring access to quality legal services. We have a mechanism here in the city, in the state that works, and we look forward to collaborating with you and our advocates in the community to assess the ongoing needs and figure out how we can even get better at what we're already doing well. Right on, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Councilman Eugene who has some questions. <coughs> Councilmember Eugene, so Thank nice you very much, Mr. You. Chair. Pleasure to see you, Commissioner. Nice to see you uh, over the Veterans uh, Week festivities. Thank so you so a, much. It's always a pleasure to see you, and thank you for the job that you are doing on behalf of our veterans. And we all know that uh, all of us in New York City, we all we owe to the veterans a good deal of uh, gratitude for what they have done mm. for this uh, country, for this city. And uh, I'm always uh, pleased to see when we are working together to make the effort to provide them with uh, what they need. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for your leadership. You're very welcome. So but I got uh, a question probably, uh, I need some clarification about the uh, discharge. So uh, I, I've been reading uh, the concept paper, it seems that, uh, and they say that there are five type of discharges mm -hmm. that a service member may receive, honorable discharge, general discharge, and dishonorable, you know, three mm -hmm. categories. And uh, they mention also that the general discharge is given to those whose service was faithful and honest in spite of some trouble as determined by the commander. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said also that some reason, reasons a member may receive a general discharge as opposed to honorable include a failure to maintain military standards mm -hmm. in a weight, fitness, dress or appearance, a, fa a failure to progress in training or a series of minor disciplinary infractions. Mm -hmm. But this is the part that I'm really interested, you know, to know more classification about. General discharge can also be given for conditions such as illness and injury. Mm -hmm. And s they mention also that uh, while general discharge is often equated with honorable discharge, this discharge category actually disqualifies the veteran from receiving certain benefit. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about the the the, uh, uh, the veteran was discharged because of illness of injuries. Mm -hmm. Are they also disqualified from receiving certain services? So, uh, Councilmember Eugene, you you are absolutely. Uh, illuminating the complexities of this particular issue because you're right, commanders uh, uh, have the discretion to determine what uh, discharge status is appropriate um, and to understand what the rationale may be for any particular situation, you have to really dig into it. There are re-entry codes and separation codes and those are changed on an annual basis. I mean, when we get a chance to talk to our legal service providers here mm -hmm. later in this hearing, I think th uh, they'll be able to even more fully explain to you that uh, it's a it, it's a very very complex uh, area of law, and it really requires folks who know what they're looking for, who know how the system works, and who are in it for the long haul, who can really follow these very complex cases from the very beginning through adjudication and hopeful resolution. But for example, one of the things you mentioned, uh, you know, can someone for a, uh, a medical condition or injury 
you know, what, what, how does that, um, uh, how, how does that, how is that affected by a dis, uh, you know, a, a particular discharge status? One of the things that's happened in these last uh, 18 years now since the improvised explosive device has become the signature weapon in this set of post 9-11 uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan is that we've had a number of service members, not just here in New York, but around the country who have been honorably discharged but with an administrative separation, for example, with a personality disorder, when really what they should have been diagnosed and in fact separated with would have been, let's say, traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress disorder and medically discharged so that they could then continue to get their, their health care benefits for a service-related condition. So there are all kinds of um, intricacies here that really needed to be need to be sorted out by, by competent legal counsel, and that's why we, understanding this and wanting to ensure that our veterans are receiving the best possible counsel, advice, support, and assistance, we want to continue with the mechanism that has worked so well and that with counsel continued support will continue to improve as we go forward. But it's a very complex, uh, th there's no simple way to answer your question, uh, Council Member Eugene, other than to lay out just how many openings there are and how many different uh, branches and sequels and possibilities. It's a very complex area of law. And thank you very much, Commissioner, for this uh, very useful information. And, uh, uh, you know, in my ignorance. No, no, no. And, uh, we're and we know that you, 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 you clearly clarify the, you know, the complexity of this mm -hmm. situation, and I do appreciate that because I was thinking about uh, those uh, 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 veterans uh, who didn't have any other bad behavior or any other failure in anything, mm -hmm. but because they were injured or get, they have a sickness, and then they cannot be qualified to receive benefits. And that's this precisely is, one of the you know, issues. This is something uh, very... For example, uh, <laughs> there are veterans we know, Department of Defense has acknowledged, in fact, that's part of why the DOD and the VA, they have recently set up an mm -hmm. online web portal where veterans can actually apply online to uh, get their discharge applications going forward through the system. Now, I will say, they also say on the online portal that it's a very good idea to link up with a veteran service organization and or a qualified expert legal service provider. But it's because of this these situations where, for example, with the IED, blast injuries, having been so prevalent in the post-9-11 era, we have individuals who they may have uh, shown up late to PT, they may have been involved in, in behaviors that were characterized as qualifying for a misconduct discharge, but in fact can be traced back to their traumatic brain injury. And so those are the kinds of things that DOD and the VA have signaled. We know they're out there. That's why we've set up these uh, portals, we've set up these supports, okay. we're now all really in a position where we need to get to the outreach, as has been said already, so that we get the word out to veterans so that they know they're not in this alone, that we're there as a city. And increasingly, I think you're going you're gonna to see more of this effort going on at the state and the federal level as well. I can't speak directly to that. I don't have no authority. But I will say that as, as complex as it is, we're blessed to have the organizational and the institutional recognition that there have been some uh, problem areas which need to be resolved and that have an <coughs> undue, unintended negative impact on the lives of, of veterans and their, their family members. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And I, my hope is to see that uh, our medical expert and legal experts and expert in, in, in you know, and uh, uh, feel related to the same issue can come together and 
try to address this very, very complex uh, situation Definitely. in order to uh, do justice to uh, the veterans who unfortunately uh, receive a, a, a general discharge because of their injury or, or disease. Because uh, before we didn't know about PTSD. And well, this is a and as an very example, as, as an example, Council Member Eugene, uh, just to look at the history of this issue mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to trauma, you know, World War II, this was a, this was a criminal mm -hmm. matter and was handled as such. As psychiatry, my field, be sort of matured and came of age, then things sort of shifted. It was, it was regarded as a medical disorder. That changed in 1980, thanks so much to the service, the sacrifice, the courage of our Vietnam brothers and sisters in the veterans community who came forward and demanded better treatment and set up the vet centers and, 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 and the diagnosis then of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, became established and it was no longer a, uh, a, a criminal matter or a moral defect, but indeed uh, a medical condition that requires early intervention when, whenever possible, social support, medical treatment, and ongoing, uh, ongoing vigilance. So you're right, we've made progress uh, over time but we still have a lot of work to do, particularly for those veterans who are out there today who are unable to access the medical support, treatment, and benefits that they've deserved by virtue of their discharge status. So whatever we can do to intervene as early as possible, get them linked up with quality expert legal service provider help, we have done a huge, we have, we, we, We've made a dent in repaying that debt and we'll continue to look for every veteran who's possibly in need and can benefit from this kind of support. So thank you so much for your concern and, and questions and ideas. And thank, thank you also, Commissioner, for your dedication and your outstanding service on behalf of the veterans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Council. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'm all set. I mean, I think... Um, our government certainly, you know, all our eyes are on New York City, and that's the way we like it. Um, so we got to make sure we're leading, um, and you know, we have an obligation to provide uh, all veterans with the physical and, and mental health care um, and benefits that they deserve and that they were promised, and um, no questions asked. You know, and um, I often like to say that that while we may question the wisdom of war, uh, we certainly can never question the sacrifice of the warrior. Thank um, you. And, and that's and that's that's why we're here. So thank you guys very much. Thank you thank so you. much, Council Member Diana and Eugene. Okay, we're gonna call up. Um, I don't know. Yeah. We're gonna call up uh, folks in groups of three. First panel is going to be Kent Elar, Ashton Stewart, and Coco Colhave. Okay, and if you can just say who you're with, your name and who you're with before you give the, your testimony, just so we can get it on the record. So we, we got you guys on a three minute timer. So we have the t if if we have your t three minutes each, um, if we have your testimony, then just sort of give us some of the what you really want us to take away, um, and then just remember when you start, say your name and your group so we can make sure it's on the record. Go ahead when you're ready. Okay. All right. Um, uh, my name is Ken Eiler. Uh, I'm the project director of the City Bar Justice Center's Veterans Assistance Project. Um, good afternoon uh, to the honorable members of this committee. Uh, my full testimony is available to you in writing. Uh, just in summary, the City Bar Justice Center leverages the volunteer time and expertise of New York City's legal community to serve veterans who have a claim or appeal before the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. 
Last year, the lawyers of the Veterans Assistance Project helped veterans obtain $770,532.65 in retroactive benefits from the VA and $40,322.86 in new monthly recurring benefits. I've been in my role at the City Bar Justice Center for three and a half years and continue to serve as a major in the United States Air Force Reserve Judge Advocate General's Corps. I first began my legal career as a JAG over a decade ago on active duty. To be sure, the subject of today's hearing rightly identifies a real problem, the need for assistance by veterans who seek a discharge upgrade. The denial of an honorable service characterization of our LGBTQ service members was a grave injustice and must be corrected. We commend the city taking what steps it can to issue a city certificate of eligibility as called for by the proposed legislation to mitigate such effects. In addition, both bills call for the involvement of legal counsel or accredited representatives which raise a concern. To be clear, we certainly believe the city should support experienced, not-for-profit lawyers and advocates doing this work. But those of us already working in this field have identified another problem, a secondary problem that arises in connection with the need for assistance in connection with discharge upgrades as well as VA benefits. The secondary problem is the demand for able, experienced, accredited representatives is vastly outstripped by the demand of veterans who need assistance. The City Bars program currently has an eight to 10 month wait for placements. Veterans who do not wish to wait are given referral information to one of our other legal services providers uh, who do this work, but despite this reality, we still have a significant wait list. It is not lost on the veteran population that there is a shortage of well-trained lawyers to help. Most of our clients went to non-lawyer advocates before they came to the City Bar Justice Center. The lack of experienced and qualified representatives is a problem the VA itself has suffered from for decades and some would argue since its inception. All the good intention in the world will not make someone who is inadequately trained and inadequately supervised effective. We need to be careful not to recreate this problem in the proposed discharge upgrade unit. The veterans community has an expression for veterans who are stuck in endless claims and appeals with the VA. These veterans are stuck in the hamster wheel. The perfect encapsulation of the hamster wheel came from a caller several years ago to the City Bars Veterans Project. My coordinator at the time was trying to understand the assistance that the veteran was seeking. At one point, she asked, the she asked the veteran, are you seeking assistance with filing a claim with the VA? The veteran responded, oh no, I've been filing the same claim with the VA each year, every year, only to watch it be denied year after year. I've got that process down. The veteran's comment perfectly articulates what the hamster wheel is and encapsulates the problem of the lack of experienced and qualified representatives in this area. The veteran had multiple offers of support. Many, if not all, I'm sure were well-intentioned. I see my time has expired. Finish? Okay, just a few more sentences. Um, uh, it will be vital given limited resources that DVS and the nonprofit organizations that receive its support not merely have accredited individuals, but have the knowledge that comes from experience so the blind are not leading the blind, that the services offered are being effective, and that we're getting veterans off of the hamster wheel rather than merely extending the time that they spend on it. To that end, I would urge the members of this committee to listen to recommendations and speak with experienced practitioners in this area. We look forward to partnering, partnering with the City Council on smart, efficient solutions to help New York veterans to receive the federal benefits that they're entitled to receive. Thank you for your time and commitment to the city's veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Brennan, for holding this hearing today. My name is Ashton Stewart, and I'm the coordinator of Sage Vets, the program at Sage. Sage Vets was created with the idea that if an in individual had discharge issues that had to do with their sexual orientation, Sage would work with other community partners to try to get those discharges overturned or reclassified, particularly if they were, they are, they were a bar to receiving VA or other veteran services. For this reason, Sage wholeheartedly supports the discharge characterization of great assistance legislation being proposed to help veterans gain access to benefits they have earned for their service. We believe that taking this step will bring profile to the important issue of LGBT service members wrongfully, wrongfully discharged from the military because of their sexual orientation. Serving their country is the pinnacle of patriotism for many people, and knowing that our military has given a less than honorable discharge to thousands of talented, committed individuals for nothing more than their personal sexual orientation in itself is dishonorable. The monetary and psychological implications and repercussions of this hypocritical policy need to be addressed openly and honestly in order to rectify the past. Council members, thank you for your continued support of SAGE and for your support of the rights and fair treatment of all New Yorkers, including those who are older adults and members of the LGBT community. We at SAGE look forward to partnering with the New York City Council and DVS to ensure that LGBT veterans can receive the support that they so richly deserve after serving our country with with distinction, pride, and honor. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, 
I'm Coco Colhane. I'm the director of the Veteran Advocacy Project. Uh, I also teach a veterans clinic at Brooklyn Law School, and I sit on a number of boards regarding discharge upgrades, one national and one the newly formed New York State Division. Um, I'm just, you know, I have the written testimony, so I'm just going to cover a few things that came up as uh, testimony was ongoing. You know, we have seen, we used to have a wait list of 650 names of veterans waiting for us to investigate, not to, do, not to take their case, just to investigate if there was merit. Uh, in the last one year and 11 months, I just ran a report, 571 veterans have come to us looking for a discharge upgrade. We recognize there's no way that we could ever serve all of these individuals, and we had to create guidelines, and it was one of the most difficult days in our office triaging, cutting all of those individuals. Um, what I'd like to say is that the idea that there are resources, lots of legal services in New York doing this work is a complete fallacy. Um, there are three public interest attorneys I am aware of who are actually trained to do this work and they're all in this room. So I completely and strongly agree with the commissioner's testimony that this is not something that we should be dumping on DVS. Um, they need to stick true to their mission. Um, I testified a couple of weeks ago about that, that their role should not be those direct services and certainly not in the legal arena. Um, but the city does need to do more to support this work. Um, the path you'll read, you can see in my testimony, the path of a case from intake to decision. It requires forensic psychiatrists. It requires many partners that we work with um, there are, there's rarely a case where you can just change the narrative reason. If a veteran has an honorable <coughs> and they have homosexual admission, sure, two-page application, perfect, great. And that's something that a lot of people can be doing. But those are rare. So what, what do you um, suggest? What, what would be a like, perfect world? What would it look like? A perfect world, there would be more outreach and training so that people understand these issues, so that people understand why individuals are given less than honorable discharges, right? I mean, the stats on it, one stat I have in my testimony is that of the veterans who were discharged for misconduct and had a mental illness, a diagnosis already from the years 2011 to 2015, only 4% were given an honorable discharge. So that tells us we are basically punishing people because of their mental health condition. And a lot of those conditions, these, the conditions that they recorded were PTSD, anxiety, depression, a lot of things that they acquired during their service. So that's a terrific injustice. And we need to be doing more at this level to support these individuals who are deeply, a lot of whom are deeply wounded. Mm -hmm. And it's not just as simple as coming in and you know, changing something on a piece of paper. No, I mean, a, a case can take, an average case for us takes two to three years. Wow. Um, Ashton, has Sage Vets ever received funding from the city council or from, or from other city agencies? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Not at this time. Our funding uh, for the Sage Vets program is exclu exclusively from the state legislature okay. since its inception in 2014. Okay. Is there a reason for that or you just haven't? We just have, we've had a sufficient um, funding for doing what we're doing. I've been with the program since May. I'm the only person working on the program, <coughs> along with my supervisor, Tom Weber. Um, and we have a lot of partner groups throughout the state. It's a statewide program. It's gaining a lot of momentum. Um, but okay. that's where we are so far. Uh, Kent, how, do you, how would you suggest we get more experienced lawyers um, into this kind of work to help alleviate some of the backlog? Mm. It's, a, it's a great question. Um, there, there is. We, we have been, as, as a profession, the legal profession, we have been behind the curve. And, and I say that as a representative of my profession. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a, we're in law school, we're taught, and we learn about uh, property and criminal law cases that are four and five centuries old. Uh, <laughs> veterans law, by comparison, I, I tell my volunteers uh, at the New York City Bar who, who want to take one of these cases and work with me, uh, veterans law just turned 30 this wow. year. Right. Um, so, so part of it is, is the academy's need to get up to speed. Uh, and then I think, you know, as, and they're in the process of doing that, um, we, we should have uh, a, a veterans 
uh, benefits clinic in addition to my colleague Coco's excellent program at Brooklyn uh, in the city. That would be, that would be good um, as to have. That would be certainly an addition. But um, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time to, for the academy to get up to speed so that, that um, you know, I, I, when I look at the veteran space, I sort of think the model is uh, what we see in immigration today, where we have a robust uh, uh, public interest bar that's doing this work, pro, robust pro bono response, uh, and there's room for private practitioners to do the work as well, because there's, there's certainly the need. Right. Okay. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Okay, our next panel is going to be Samuel Malik. I'm sorry I, if I can't read your handwriting. Jonathan Teheli, Telki, and Joe Bello. And when you come up, just say your name, uh, the group that you're representing, and, and then before you give us your testimonies, we can get you on the record. Okay, if we have your testimony already and you want to just give us the bullet points, that's great. We're going to put you on a three-minute clock, but we're not, we're not too strict here. So if you want to begin, left to right, go ahead, sure. Just say your name and the group that you're with. Hello, my name is Yonatan Teleki. I'm opposed uh, this bill. I'm with Juice for Morality, uh, specifically the drum bill. Uh, I'm opposed. Uh, the fact was that uh, this conduct was against the law at the time period in question uh, for military uh, for people in the military, and thus you're now trying to retroactively reward people for breaking the law. Num number two, people who, there are many other people who are dis uh, discharged for reasons of uh, that are much that are uh, in existence. There was a, um, someone who was discharged for, uh, for having a biblical verse out. There were people who, who are now potentially going to be discharged for a, po for a chaplain who refused to perform a, a same-sex wedding, who's now under questions if he's going to get dis uh, dishonorably discharged. So they're not going to get – we don't consider anything for them. We don't have any – if you were opposed for religious, for religious reasons, which are many people over the past – 200 years who've been a, who were discharged for different religious reasons. We don't have any bills for them. We have it specifically for another group who is breaking the law that doesn't even have an explicit First Amendment right. Number three, many people who w were dishonorably discharged for uh, homosexual behavior, mm, uh, uh, when the, they were discharged, they could have done other offenses, but they went after them for the strongest offense because dishonorably discharge is much greater than discharge for uh, uh, for, for one of the other three four, three reasons that would be non honorably four reasons for a non honorably discharge. So, if you have two choices as a prosecutor, you would try to go after the higher charge. Now, uh, if you, it's clear cut. There's no reason to make the case for a lower. So now there's no investigation here. If there was anything else wrong in the service that could have went, that they could have went after them for, you'd only have it if it was on record of that's why they were were, were discharged. But there, because of the fact that they already had a clear cut, open door shot case, there's no reason to, to for for at the time to go after them for something else that would have been a minor, more minor offense. So this. You have no idea someone in uh, who was discharged for other reasons how that how that would affect them. Uh, for that and many other reasons, I oppose this bill. Good. So, uh, first of all, my name is Samuel Malik. I'm the policy director and legislative advocacy director for the New York City Veterans Alliance. Uh, so, good afternoon, uh, and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to testify. Uh, we are a members-driven organization drawn through policy advocacy community building organization that advances veterans and their families as civically engaged. On behalf of our members and supporters, we state our firm support for veterans with bad, paper discharges who receive critical services, particularly those veterans unjustly discharged because of their sexual orientation and sexual identity, or because of untreated traumas from the battlefield or from sexual assault within the ranks. 
for this reason, we applaud the intent of this committee in addressing bad data discharges, seeking to right the wrongs of federal bureaucracy. We do not, however, support the expansion of the New York City Department of Veterans Services to duplicate the expert legal services already at work in the nonprofit sector. They will have been done. New York City Veterans Alliance testified before this com the committee December of 2015 in favor of two resolutions in support of state and federal legislation to restore honor and benefits to veterans unjustly discharged from the military under General Frank Bell and prior policy in case they vindicated against LBC individuals. New York City Veterans Alliance also brought to hearing Resolution 1196, also in 2015, which we proposed to this committee in support of federal legislation bringing fair policies to the federal discharges we will be processing. Though none of these resolutions passed this committee, nor did the corresponding state and federal legislation pass, we bring to this committee's attention that some measure of progress has been made towards permitting veterans discharged with bad paper to receive potentially life-saving services in the VA. Although we remain fully committed to justice for veterans who are wrongly discharged and fairness in the discharge review board process, we urge members of this committee to review transcripts of these quality hearings. With prior testimony by the Veterans Advocacy Project, American Veterans for Equal Rights, High Ground Veterans Advocacy, the Vietnam Veterans of America, and others have been clear before this committee is the complexity, and you also heard some additional testimony, the complexity and longevity of the discharge upgrade process. The expert legal services involved in advancing these cases is important and it is not easy. If VDS is required to create a standard unit dedicated to discharge upgrade. Of considerable resources not provided in its current staffing and budget. We believe the effects of this legislation would be detrimental to DVS in carrying out its mission and mandate. For these reasons, we urge the committee to table intro 1218. A couple more sentences. Yet support for veterans with bad paper remains urgently needed. As we have testified previously, these veterans are most likely to experience homelessness, substance abuse, incarceration, and are at higher risk for suicide. So we support the intent of intro 479 to ensure that all city services for veterans are available to those unjustly discharged. But we urge this committee to revise intro 479 to be more broadly inclusive, ensuring that veterans discharged as a result of untreated traumas, including sexual assault incurred during military service also receive the benefits accorded to the bill. Exclusion of any category of wrongly discharged veterans would merely repeat the historic wrongs of federal policy. We further recommend intro 479 to be amended to permit DVS to accomplish a cursory review of service records during the course of its current processes for aiding veterans and linking them with legal services available through Vet Connect NYC network. To offer impactful support to wrongly discharged veterans, we urge this committee to seek to strengthen and support the robust network of service providers who offer services and support to veterans with bad paper discharges instead of saddling a small agency with additional mandates. We urge the council to offer a larger share of support and discretionary funding for service providers who have already have the expertise and institutional knowledge needed to navigate the complexities of the discharge upgrade process. We also urge the committee to offer further support for mental health services, housing services, employment services, and other essential support for veterans with bad paper discharges. On behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance, thank you for the opportunity to testify, and pending your questions, concludes my testimony. Thank you. Joe. All right. Uh, members of the Veterans Committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Joe Bello. I come before you to voice my thoughts regarding intros 479 and 1218. Uh, my concerns with these bills both extend back to what DVS actually does. And looking at the city charter, DVS was created to inform and act as a hub for all services that are currently available out there for veterans. As DVS has moved or been pushed, depending on how you look at it, towards a service-based agency, I would argue that we cannot ask for more money for more services without having a better idea as to what the veterans needs and are they looking for. 
This comes in the form of better and more detailed data regarding the numbers DVS are seeing and the services they are providing. In looking at the mayor's MMR report from September, where it says veterans and their families engaged by DVS, it lists 7,521 for FY18, and for veterans and their families given assistance to access resources, 2,791. That's out of at least 210,000 veterans in New York City, not including family members. And going back to the 105 that was listed for uh, legal services. So obviously there's a gap in the data, so we have to have better data in terms of like who's looking for what services, what's coming out of that. And I think we heard from uh, particularly COCO, the legal services, they're actually seeing the greater numbers and I would actually defer to them. So there needs to be a conversation between DVS, the legal service providers, and even um, OCJ and, uh, who, and you know what the numbers are coming out of Vet Connect NYC to see what those numbers, what is those numbers are telling us other than uh, employment, education, and legal and entrepreneurial. So when we talk legal, we are talking uh, family, family court, you know, we're talking disability claims as well. So there needs to be a better, a better view, a look in more details as to see what, what those things are going to be. Um, I would argue that we have no, we really have no idea how many LBGTQ veterans have come forth over the past year, two, or even longer looking for discharge upgrades. We also don't have the data of how many veterans have engaged the Department of Veterans Services for discharge characterization upgrades. Um, again, this goes back to going back, take a step back and we need to look at the data and where we go from there. Therefore, to create this unit without any data on the need, we look like we're throwing money into hiring more for DVS or for a unit that we have no, many, no idea how many veterans will use. Not to mention, and it was said before, the training required for this initiative, which I'm sure many of the legal groups here attested to. There's also the question of redundancy. And while we are a city that looks to help all veterans, and while I understand the legislation, I am concerned about those we are leaving behind and segmenting, particularly in 479. And as was said by a number of people, I recommend that the legislation include those veterans who are given bad discharges based on mental health issues, which has been, been well documented and even said here in the past. In conclusion, I have to agree with my colleague here that I, will ha I would like to see these legislations tabled at this time which is probably a first for me. Uh, uh, just looking at the legislation this committee has proposed or passed in the last few months, let's focus on that first. I remind the chair that the commissioner um, didn't commit one way or the other against intro 118 last month for an annual report to include specific personnel and performance indicators. Again, that goes back to data, so we need to have a look in on that. Uh, as such, my concern would be that there needs to be a conversation, and as I said this before, between the council, the legal service providers, DVS, and all other parties to see what the data is saying and where the need actually is. So thank you very much for your testimony. Time. Thank you all very much. Okay, we have our last panel now. Um, Vadim from IAVA. Vinny Meyer, I'm sorry if I can't read your name. Denny. Denny, Denny Meyer. And Cecilia Grantilli or Gentilly? If you could all just say your name and the group you're with before you start your testimony. Radio check. Uh, my name is Vadim Panasuk. I'm with uh, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Um, I've uh, amended my testimony for brevity uh, reasons. Uh, full text is available online at IVA.org um, and is also available to Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I begin, I'd like to um, uh, acknowledge uh, a second death this month in Afghanistan um, uh, of a sergeant in the 75th uh, Ranger Re uh, Regiment, um, Sergeant Leonardo Jasso. Uh, killed in uh, Kashra district of uh, Nimroz province in southern Afghanistan um, in the 17th year of um, our war there. Um, also, this bill, uh, these bills are very timely uh, due to uh, the current administration's uh, redoubling of efforts uh, to ban trans troops from serving um, by uh, requesting the Supreme Court to let it enforce uh, the ban over the weekend. Um, and I will begin my testimony now. Uh, Council uh, Member Brennan and uh, distinguished members of the committee on the behalf of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America and our more than, uh, uh, than 425,000 members 
I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify here today uh, and on uh, pending legislation. I'm a New Yorker, a naturalized citizen, a U.S. Army veteran. Um, at IVA, I'm a master level social worker uh, with a se uh, uh, serving as a senior veteran transition manager, uh, VA benefits lead with our uh, Rapid Response Referral Program, or RIP for short. RIP is a high-tech, high-touch service for veterans and their families uh, with a comprehensive case management component. Uh, to date, uh, we have served over 9,000 veterans and family members nationwide and over 1,000 in New York City alone, providing uh, critical support and resources. Um, after 14 years, IAVA has become the preferred empowerment organization of, uh, for post-9-11 veterans. While our members are spread throughout the nation, we are proud to say uh, uh, that our national headquarters is located here in New York City. IVA has a proud history of being on the forefront of equal rights for all service members and veterans. Based on feedback and guidance from our membership during our annual member survey, we became the first uh, mainstream veterans organization uh, to come out in support of repeal, uh, don't ask, don't tell. Uh, debt. Promoting equal equality for all troops and veterans remains a key part of IVA's policy agenda. It is with this long history of promoting equality for uh, all of our veterans and service members that IVA supports the intention behind uh, both of the bills before the committee today, Intel uh, 479 and 1218. We recognize that the changes of status and benefits available to LGBTQ troops, uh, veterans, and past, uh, in the past could leave many of them confused or unaware um, of what is available to them. This problem is compounded by veterans who are disconnected from the VA and DOD because of their discharge status. Many veterans may not be aware that they can change their status. Others may feel shunned or fear fearful of the VA because of their discharge status. In my experience, uh, th these veterans are often uh, the most vulnerable in the population. As a VTM, uh, I have s uh, worked with almost 400 veterans and their families 162 uh, had a less than um, honorable discharge while making up a fraction of the total population. Uh, due to loss of access uh, to programs and benefits, as well as the stigma associated with their discharge status, these veterans often have a much more difficult road ahead when they transition back. While IVA supports the intention of the bill, we, we do have concerns over implementation. Upgrading a discharge status can be an extremely lengthy process. Additionally, there are already processes in the nonprofit sector that will help veterans upgrade their discharge status for free of charge. IVA is concerned that the passage of these bills could create confusion among the nonprofit uh, and veteran community. Uh, DVS may be better served to com complement these existing services rather than competing or duplicating them. Veteran, uh, veterans discharged solely because of their sexual orientation or, uh, or identity deserve the full benefits of the VA in New, York's, in New York's DVS. IVA is in, uh, encouraged by uh, Intel 1218 focus on communica uh, communication for its services in assisting veterans with their discharge status. However, it may be better served uh, to use the existing government outreach services to complement existing nonprofit discharge assistance. We also encourage council and DVS to go beyond just, uh, just posting about these services on their website, but also to have an outreach plan through email, social media, and other means in order to maximize awareness of these existing programs. As noted earlier, uh, many veterans may no longer be connected to the VA or DOD community because of their discharge status. Members of the committee, thank you for, your uh, for the opportunity to share IVA's views on these issues today. I look forward to answering any questions you may have and working with the committee in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Denny. Okay. Uh, I'm, De I'm Sergeant First Class Denny Meyer, uh, the President of American Veterans for Equal Rights in New York, and the National Public Affairs Officer of AVER, as well as of Transgender American Veterans Association. From World War II to 1994, over 100,000 LGBT American patriots were less than honorably discharged due to being homosexual. And from 1994 to 2011, over 14,000 more patriots were involuntarily discharged under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. The major uh, and, and the majority of people under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, many got honorable discharges, but the narrative nevertheless spelled out due to homosexuality which deprived them of many job opportunities. During Don't Ask, Don't Tell, 
minority women were most likely to receive doubly discriminatory, less than honorable discharges during that period. In 2005, Massachusetts Representative Marty Meehan introduced a bill to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which contained pages of provisions to rectify prior discrimination policy, including discharge upgrades. Congress failed to pass that bill. In 2010, a compromise Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal bill created in the Senate Armed Services Committee passed. All provisions to rectify past discriminatory denial of rights and benefits to veterans were stripped out of that bill, which resulted in ongoing discriminatory denial of rights and benefits to veterans previously discharged due to being gay. In 2005, at the request of Avenue New York, the New York City Council, led by Speaker Giff Miller, passed the nation's first Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal resolution, which was copied by cities and counties across the nation and by the state of California. This enhanced the congressional will to eventually repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 2010. In 2013, the Restore Honor to Service Members Act was introduced to automate and streamline discharge upgrades for LGBT veterans by Congressman Charles Rangel of New York, openly gay Congressman Jared Polis, who was just elected governor of Colorado, and Senators Gillibrand of New York and Schatz of Hawaii. Introduced two more times, this bill never got out of committee. In 2015, New York State Senator Brad Hoylman introduced a New York State Restoration of Honor Bill to guarantee New York State benefits to LGBT veterans regardless of discharge status. That too was blocked and never got out of committee. Meanwhile, Canada provides both restitution and a medal to rectify past discrimination suffered by LGBT veterans. Hence the, New York's, I'm almost done. Hence, the New York City legislation under consideration today to enable New York City patriotic LGBT veterans to be eligible for all the benefits they have earned serving our nation. It has been, uh, it has been Avers and Tavers' highest priority to advocate for real and equal benefits for LGBT veterans. So I've written here, we strongly urge and advocate passage of this legislation. Having heard other testimony, it's clear that there needs to be negotiation to work out the legal realities and bureaucracy. What makes me bug my eyes out is the bureaucracy and the arguments that, oh, well, we can't do this because of that and so on and so forth. The fact is, there's over 100,000 LGBT veterans and more who were kicked out for being gay, simply out of raw governmental discrimination. And somebody's got to decide who's going to help them, who's going to rectify this. It's as simple as that. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Thank you so much um, for um, all that information. It's, um, it's really, really worrying to hear that and uh, for how many years this has uh, been trying to be rectified and, um, you know, repaired. But you know, um, I hope I hope this is the time. Um, my name is Cecilia Gentile, and I am the managing director of policy and public affairs at Gay Mental Crisis (GMAC). Thank you for allowing me to speak today on behalf of the military veterans who are clients of GMAC and members of our staff. GMAC has tremendous respect for our military. Every year during our November All Staff Meeting. Our CEO, Kelsey Louie, asked GMAC staff, who are also veterans, to stand up and be counted. Those team members get some of the loudest cheers of the entire year, since many of us have heard about what they have been through. But those staff members are applauded not only for their past services to the United States, but also for their current life-saving work at GMAC. Many of them work with LGBT clients who are also veterans and who in many cases need specialized support and care coordination. 
We know that military veterans tend to experience higher rates of mental health and substance abuse issues than the general population. And through GMAC work, we know that the same is true for LGBT people, especially if they're living or at risk for HIV inspection, infection. When a client is both LGBT and a veteran, you have a little bit of a perfect storm when it comes to emotional issues that need professional, compassionate interventions. We see this all the time, and we are grateful for the veterans on our staff who can help guide our programs and services properly. We will continue to work with our LGBT brothers and sisters who are veterans, and we urge New York City to understand and address these unique needs and challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.